Bueno, muy buenos días, muy buenos días a todos. Bienvenidos. Bienvenidos a esta segunda serie de martes patrimoniales. Me refiero segunda porque el año pasado tuvimos toda la primera serie de webinars eh, y este año comienza la segunda serie de webinars de eh, martes patrimoniales ya en 2021. Eh, les recuerdo a todos que tenemos hoy interpretación en inglés, español y portugués. We have interpretation in English, Spanish and Portuguese. Solamente hay que ir a la barra baja y apretar el icono del mundo y escoger el idioma de su preferencia. You just need to go to the bottom of the screen and click on the world icon and you will have there three options, English, Spanish and Portuguese. Um, esta segunda serie de martes patrimoniales, les recuerdo a todos que eh, está basada en la plataforma de Patrimonio Vivo y eh, que es una plataforma regional eh, para toda América Latina, y el, eh, América Latina y el Caribe. Hoy estaremos conversando específicamente sobre invirtiendo en el patrimonio para impulsar un desarrollo sostenible. Les pedimos por favor a todos que pongan su micrófono en silencio. Eh, vamos a tener habilitado el chat para los que quieran hacer algunas preguntas. Les recuerdo también que estos eventos, así como fue el año pasado, igual este año, eh, duran una hora exacta. Arrancamos ahorita, que son las 10 eh, de la mañana aquí en Washington, D.C. Y a las 11 terminamos y estaremos así todos los martes que tengamos martes patrimoniales. Sin más, eh, quiero darle la palabra a eh, Tatiana Gallego, quien es la jefa de división del de Departamento Urbano y de Vivienda aquí en el Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo. Tatiana, como siempre, un súper placer que nos acompañes. Gracias, Luis Manuel. Y la verdad, eh, estoy súper eh, emocionada de comenzar esta segunda serie de seminarios sobre patrimonio, que desde el BIR hemos estado impulsando, como bien mencionabas, desde el año pasado. Creo que lo más importante, y como tenemos el tiempo bien contado, es el escuchar a nuestra, a nuestra invitada de apertura del día de hoy y luego, por otro lado, también a nuestra, a nuestra audiencia. Así que voy a ser muy breve, pero me gustaría mencionar el, el gran éxito de cierre que tuvimos con Martes Patrimoniales el año pasado. Es una serie que, que como todos ustedes saben, no solamente digamos, aporta como plataforma de, digamos, de intercambio de ideas y de, y de oportunidades entre, el, entre, digamos, actores dentro de la ciudad, ya sean dentro de lo que es el gobierno local, eh, ciudades, eh, eh, digamos, actores de la sociedad civil o de la academia, pero además nos ha permitido el generar un interés eh, muy amplio entre, entre lo que es, eh, digamos, el, el, el mundo de, digamos, de, del desarrollo y especialmente del desarrollo urbano. Eh, el año pasado cerramos después de nueve sesiones con un gran éxito y este año estamos lanzando la primera de todas hoy eh, y para ello tenemos a Bonnie Burnham, Burnham so, perdón, eh, acompañándonos esta mañana. Eh, vamos a tener en, en, en sesión, creo que son diez, eh, diez martes patrimoniales adicionales en los que esperamos nos estén acompañando. Y creo que, eh, digamos, después de un año tan duro como fue eh, 2020 en, en las ciudades de América Latina y el Caribe, el valor que ha tenido no solamente desde un punto de vista de identidad, de recuperación, pero también de unidad social, eh, de, entre el, el valor de las industrias creativas y de las industrias culturales, es crítico. Eh, para hacer ciudad y para hacer una sociedad más cohesiva. Con eso le paso la palabra a Bonnie. Bonnie, eh, bienvenida. Es un placer tenerte con nosotros y, y de verdad estamos muy agradecidos eh, de que estés abriendo esta, esta sesión, esta nueva, digamos, eh, este nuevo set de, de matres, martes patrimoniales y, y de tenerte especialmente en este. Bienvenida. Gracias, Tatiana. Gracias, Bonnie. 
te robo un segundito unas palabras porque Jesús quería hacerte una presentación a ti un poco más profunda también. Entonces, entonces rápidamente ahí eh, eh, presento sencillamente a Jesús para el público. Ya tenemos casi 50 personas. Muchísimas gracias, Tatiana. Eh, Jesús es especialista del área urbana y de vivienda y además es el coordinador de la plataforma de Patrimonio Vivo, quien llevó con nosotros eh, el, el año pasado las 10 sesiones, 9 sesiones que dice Tatiana. Y como siempre desde aquí, muchísimo eh, eh, encantado, como siempre, de ayudarlos. Jesús, adelante, te doy unos segundos ahí también para que puedas presentar a Boni aún mejor eh, y con un poquito más de detalle. Y gracias no. a Tatiana. Muchísimas gracias, a Luisma, y muchísimas gracias, Tatiana, eh, por esas palabras tan tan importantes para nosotros porque son un incentivo para continuar con este trabajo que estamos haciendo aquí en Patrimonio Vivo y precisamente en esta serie de seminarios de martes patrimoniales. No, tenemos eh, pues un gusto enorme de arrancar esta nueva serie y qué manera de arrancarla con Boni aquí con nosotros. Eh, la verdad es que vamos a tener, como lo decía Tatiana, una serie muy importante este año. Tenemos 10 sesiones, vamos a traer mejores experiencias y, y temas, eh, vamos a, a discutir y debatir temas bien, bien relevantes para todos. Eh, tenemos, vamos a traer experiencias desde de Singapur, de Holanda, de Finlandia, pero también de América Latina, vamos a traer de México, de Colombia, de varios lugares más. Pero queríamos empezar con, de una manera muy especial y por eso invitamos definitivamente a Bonnie Burnham, que seguramente algunos de ustedes ya la conocen. Bonnie fue, eh, fue, es la presidenta y la fundadora de lo que se le denomina Cultural Heritage Finance Alliance, que es una fundación eh, que está buscando, una alianza que está buscando encontrar formas innovadoras para el financiamiento de los proyectos que tienen que ver con la preservación y la puesta en valor del patrimonio. Y por eso nos interesa mucho aquí en América Latina, porque es uno de nuestros lados flacos que tenemos. Eh, Bonnie, como todos seguramente lo saben, fue la presidenta de World Monuments Fund por pues, bastantes años, desde 1985 hasta 2019. Ahora es presidenta emérita y la verdad es que es un honor tenerla con nosotros. Ha recibido muchísimos premios. Eh, me ha llamado la atención la lista de numerosos premios que tiene, pero entre ellos pues, es eh, eh, Chevalier de las... Eh, de la the French Order of Arts and Letters, entre otras cosas que ha hecho y que ha tenido, eh, como lo decía. Pero con eso no quiero quitarles más el tiempo. Eh, Bonnie, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much and, very, and, and welcome to this uh, seminar. Please, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Jesus. And it's a pleasure to be here uh, today as part of your patrimony, you know, uh, Mark, this patrimonialis session, um, I, as many of you know, was the head of the World Monuments Fund uh, for many years. And we worked on projects with uh, partners and collaborators throughout Latin America for decades. One of the first events in my, uh, at, at, in my new position at World Monuments Fund was the Mexican earthquake of 1985. Uh, so I had an opportunity of a trial by fire, learning uh, how to deal with catastrophic events and with the chronic uh, shortages of funding uh, that the heritage world faces. Uh, the World Monuments Fund was, uh, was involved as a funding partner and as a sponsor of the World Monuments Watch Program which uh, over it's now more than 20 years of history has uh, identified hundreds of sites around the world uh, and their advocates that are facing challenges. Uh, many of them, in fact, um, most prominently, the, mo the single most important challenge is the lack of financial resources uh, to do an adequate job with conservation. And uh, it was that awareness that led me Uh, as I left World Monuments Fund in 2015 to start searching for a new strategy that might complement the resources that are available from governmental sources and from philanthropic sources, that's the traditional area where World Monuments Fund works, uh, and come up with what might be called a new paradigm or 
an enlarged ecosystem for advancing the goals of the heritage field. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today in my uh, role as the president of the uh, Cultural Heritage Finance Alliance or CHIFA. It's a new organization that was uh, officially founded in late 2019 and now has been actively working toward uh, elaborating a platform for our work for the next several years. Uh, over the last uh, year, the, the pandemic gave us a, a golden opportunity really uh, to do more research and uh, reflect on the foundations that we want to build upon. Uh, it was a very revealing exercise and that's what I wanna talk about this morning. So I'm gonna put my um, presentation up on the screen. I think one of the uh, high water moments of uh, recent times has been the uh, adoption of the uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, originally the millennial goals in the year 2000, uh, during at which time to the chagrin of many of us, culture wasn't really uh, mentioned at all uh, amongst the key challenges facing humanity. And then the revision of the sustainable development goals in 2015 uh, with strenuous efforts on the part of many people in this field, UNESCO especially, and uh, other organizations to see that heritage was incorporated uh, and that uh, culture had a, a, a greater uh, visibility amongst uh, the goals that we want to face as we confront issues of climate change and inequality in the, uh, and global health problems that the world is struggling with today. Uh, we've all known uh, since that time that culture is a cross-cutting sector that impacts lives in many, many ways, from education through uh, opportunities for work, uh, for opportunities for greater understanding of, of, of equity and what it means in a cultural context. And so even though uh, our mandate in relation to sustainable development is uh, anchored in uh, target number 11.4, which has to do with uh, strengthening efforts to protect cultural heritage, uh, we have many uh, areas in which we can have impact. And I think it's very, very important for uh, as all of us are thinking about how to uh, position heritage uh, in relation to, to the larger goals of, of humanity to uh, position ourselves in order to communicate uh, the importance of our position in relation to many uh, of things that the world wants to achieve in order to uh, make the planet a viable place uh, for the future. About the same time, uh, there was a great deal of academic research uh, focused on uh, how cultural heritage and how it uh, stimulates other forms of, of growth, uh, including all the things that uh, people in the impact investment world want to know about and want to support economic growth, social equity, uh, cultural development and environmental uh, sustainability. But as is noted in the model that you see in front of you, uh, which was published as part of a European uh, reflection on this topic, cultural heritage uh, has always tended to be in a position downstream of the development of economic activities, meaning that it uh, stimulates activities but doesn't necessarily benefit directly from uh, the impacts that it creates. And the uh, recommended model was uh, the one below talking about upstreaming uh, heritage planning by putting it at the heart of economic, social, and cultural development and environmental sustainability. And uh, these were the same conclusions that uh, the, the group that has been working with me uh, at the Heritage Finance Alliance reached in relation to our own experience as to how cultural heritage conservation is normally financed. It's largely a governmental initiative. Uh, the 
rule of thumb is that 80 that governments have to come up with more or less 80% of the funding to uh, carry out a given project, uh, meaning that uh, because uh, resources are so scant and increasingly so with the kinds of demands on, uh, on us in relation to global warming and other uh, humanitarian issues, uh, that uh, only the very uh, most prominent and high profile projects really uh, get uh, to the point of implementation. And then with a somewhat marginal, uh, often catalytic uh, role of the private sector in participating by way of philanthropy. And it was that role that we captured or tried to capture at World Monuments Fund by positioning projects, particularly those included on the World Monuments Watch uh, as priorities and offering that, uh, that catalytic funding that would then help us to persuade government agencies to work with us to position those projects uh, for conservation. And it was a very effective strategy and is, uh, but it does not necessarily uh, take advantage of those externalities that occur as a result of this heritage safeguarding that you can see in this, in this demonstration. Uh, all kinds of things happen uh, when a, a, a major high, high visibility uh, preservation transformation takes place uh, across a whole range of sectors that are the, therefore positioned to benefit from it. But the safeguarding itself is one-off exercise and doesn't necessarily uh, get the benefits of those investments. And so the model that we are trying to uh, advocate for is the idea of creating uh, a new circle within this circular process that would uh, become an implementer of uh, sustainability by uh, designing projects so that they do capture some of the externalities or benefits uh, that accrue from uh, from this process. And so as we conceive it, Chifa would be the instigator of, of a, a new process that builds upon the frameworks that already exist uh, by bringing in uh, more, more private sector participation by planning for integration of, uh, of goals and by uh, making uh, specific, uh, specific plans uh, that will result in some kind of a heritage entity in a local framework, being able to uh, be a beneficiary of the, of the funding that's created uh, through this kind of initiative. We see these, uh, these development partnerships occurring uh, successfully around the world. And in the United States in particular, uh, there's been a tremendous uh, marketplace created through the existence of heritage tax credits, which are uh, an innovation of the US government with strenuous lobbying effort on the part of the National Trust for Historic Preservation that have really transformed the ability of American cities to uh, and, and uh, market players to participate in uh, heritage conservation of commercial properties and of uh, and particularly having huge impact on uh, uh, affordable housing in urban situations. And those are, those are great demonstrations, but they don't necessarily transfer from one environment to another because of the particularity of tax frameworks. And so our goal at Chifa is to be able to participate in the creation of an ecosystem that uh, will bring together disciplines that have a tendency not to work together. Urban planning, property development, conservation, and uh, investors. And uh, so what we have uh, going for us is a team that uh, spans these various disciplines. Uh, people uh, like myself with years of experience working in one or another of these silos. Uh, one of my partners is uh, deeply involved in community development. Uh, Having, having pioneered uh, affordable housing schemes in America. Another is, um, is 
practicing architect, uh, very uh, deeply involved in planning, urban planning issues, and, uh, and a wide range of others who are working with us in a local situation to try to create uh, what we consider to be uh, a new para paradigm where we uh, can uh, try help the authorities and the heritage entities that exist, including NGOs, to uh, engage with uh, sectors that are usually operating separately in, in, in local environments. Uh, so this is uh, something that every organization that wants to engage with the world of impact investment uh, needs today, a statement of theory of change that talks about how, uh, what you will do in order to produce results uh, that are desirable, uh, that, that you've essentially been created in order to bring about. And so the results that Chief is looking for is expanded preservation and productive use of valuable cultural resources, uh, many of which are at risk or even um, uh, on, on their way to, uh, to loss as a result of neglect. To uh, be able to tap into the sustainable development goals that are particularly re relevant to our, to our field. And I think those are summarized essentially in carbon efficiency or um, environmental sustainability, in equitable opportunities for the community, and in a supportive public realm that helps uh, all people living in a community to have benefit of, of uh, pub public space and of healthy living opportunities in their environments. And then we're looking for uh, translating these goals into investments that can uh, attract a range of capital sources, uh, not uh, the private sector in particular, but not only the private sector, uh, but a, a, a whole range of strategies that are used in other sectors of development, uh, particularly in the environmental sector, uh, to, uh, to issue bonds, to levy local taxes, uh, to take advantage of the fact that this investment today will continue to pr produce positive economic re results uh, 20 years uh, into the future. And therefore, how can we leverage that, that lifespan of our own activities today in order to attract more financing and therefore work on a much larger scale. And so I, what we would like to do is create uh, an, an initiative at scale that will engage these uh, wide range of financing mechanisms. An important part of this is being able to communicate uh, the results of our work to uh, to a wider global audience, uh, heritage uh, conservation is unfortunately marginalized in terms of most people's perception of what's important uh, to be able to bring forward uh, for the next generation and what is important for the use of our uh, financial or finite financial resources uh, today. And uh, people who are engaged uh, in impact investing, which is to say investors who are willing to trade a, a margin of profit for a certain amount of impact are looking at very specific earmarks. One is alignment with um, sustainable development goals. Another is performance in relation to very specific metrics uh, that are established and uh, on the horizon of, of every investor who's decided that they want to align themselves with positive social, environmental govern governance impacts and not just with return on investment. And then translating that into tangible results on the ground that can be talked about in the way of appealing stories uh, that will inspire people and convince them that uh, this isn't a marginal activity. It's something that's really, uh, that can be positioned to be at the heart of anything that happens in the transformation of an urban environment. And by urban, I don't necessarily mean only large cities, but 
uh, collective living places of humanity. And so how to uh, make that happen? Uh, this is what uh, Chief has been uh, researching over the course of the last year. And uh, we've just published uh, both a uh, research report and a more detailed uh, publication of case histories on six different models that we looked at over the uh, course of the, the last year, not knowing necessarily when we began that we were going to find a spectrum of uh, different choices that different communities had made in the way that they uh, approached th their preservation challenges. From the left-hand side of the spectrum, projects that were uh, that, that engaged a large uh, amount of public sector engagement uh, from uh, development financing uh, loans like the Inter-American Development Bank it is involved with, and our case study was FEZ, to governmentally created uh, revolving funds that uh, were uh, created in order to allow uh, heritage building trusts in the UK uh, to develop as a strategy for sustainable development has had huge success to a balanced uh, engagement between public and private sector in Mexico City uh, and a huge, uh, hugely impressive, uh, really spectacular and almost unbelievable transformation that's taken place there uh, and continues only to get better over the course of the last 20 years. And then on the right hand side of the spectrum, uh, initiatives that were undertaken exclusively and solely by the community and its citizens and uh, investors because they chose uh, to engage in, in to take advantage of an opportunity or address um, a risk that they saw on the horizon. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about a couple of those examples uh, as I go along. Uh, but what we've envisioned now as our next step of development at CHIPA is a three-step process uh, where we will engage in early stage development of a half dozen projects, uh, perhaps more. We've chosen those half dozen uh, based on uh, the criteria that you see before you, the uh, engaging with uh, cultural resources of significance that are uh, significantly at risk uh, and facing uh, urgent challenges of loss. The opportunity for transformational change in, in that physical environment, changes that people can see and experience, uh, with their, see with their own eyes and experience in terms of the impact uh, it will have on their lives. And uh, the capacity of the local partner that we, uh, who has come forward with those proposals and I think that's probably the single most important uh, criterion uh, and starting point uh, that we work working with trusted partners who share the same vision. Uh, each, each of these projects needs a kind of pre-development phase where a collaborative framework is laid down and those, uh, those metrics for impact assessment are gathered uh, so that uh, unlike what happens in most cases today with heritage conservation, you don't end up at the end of a five-year project uh, not having captured uh, the changes that have taken place in the local environment for not having uh, established the metrics at the outset. So a local team would gather that information, assess the local environment, and Hi, the Spanish translation just uh, just uh, jumped in, but anyway, I'll just keep talking. Uh, on the left-hand side, the uh, the work of the local team in assessing the potential of the local environment. Uh, this assessment would go beyond and, in fact, kind of sit on top of a specific uh, urban plan or, or strategic heritage-based strategic plan. And this is where the work of the Inter-American Development Bank and Patrimonio Vivo in particular, and Chifa intersect, uh, because Ch uh, Patrimonio Vivo is producing those urban plans, and Chifa 
uh, has the opportunity and is developing the capacity to create that project planning framework that will take it beyond just a conservation project and hopefully into the realm of private engagement. Uh, so that is the crucial uh, point of intersection. And then uh, project activation financing uh, in the form of, of lending to help uh, initiate this process and produce first uh, results of a tangible nature that will then attract other investment. So this is our uh, kind of circular strategy. At the end of this uh, phase, we could then uh, in reinitiate the whole process for our next phase of the same project or for other projects. The uh, Everyone in the world of heritage preservation today talks about stakeholder engagement, and it's critical to uh, any planning process. Uh, this this uh, image is just to uh, present the range of different kinds of structures and bodies, uh, including the governmental ones in the pale blue at the top, the uh, external ones in the purple on the lower side, and the business community in pink, uh, all of whom have to be brought into alignment uh, with an integrated vision in order to have uh, the kind of large scale results uh, that you would be seeking by trying to move beyond your traditional approach to heritage conservation into uh, a global vision. And here is uh, that same concept laid out as, as a tentative organogram of how you would get these sectors to work together and how you will design projects that will take advantage of the enhancements that the uh, private sector and the external participants like academic and, and, um, and international participants bring to an environment additional financing, visibility, leverage, uh, innovative, innovative approaches, uh, the opportunity for scale and so forth. The responsibilities that the government sector has, uh, and that includes a range of things, uh, again, of, of these silos ranging from housing to infrastructure, environment, education, tourism, culture, all of these sit within different government offices. And these offices individually and collectively, sometimes at the municipal level, create tools such as incentives and subsidies, uh, which are a great uh, source of traction in making, uh, making heritage conservation projects on a large scale get off the ground. And so on the bottom here, and this model is largely based on, on uh, the way the successful Mexico City initiative uh, was planned and therefore I would encourage you uh, to read our case studies and that one in particular, but all of them have their own very interesting lessons. Uh, at the bottom, there are three entities, uh, or, or three addresses you might say, all of which should be in everybody's address book and all of which need to find a way to work very effectively together. The office or entities, uh, in, in generally one entity that will ultimately be responsible for implementing public sector finance projects on the left. On the right, the entity that will be responsible for, uh, by, by common consensus and in principle by design for implementing and coordinating the private sector engagement. And in the middle, the most important point of coordination of all, uh, generally coming directly out of a government office such as the Ministry of Culture, the Department of Antiquities, uh, an Office of Cultural Heritage in the United States, it's the, it's the State Historic Preservation Office. A point of coordination, which is uh, often referred to as an open window where any, everybody can go to get answers to their problems and issues. The problems uh, that the private sector is going to confront are whether they're 
is a marketplace, first of all, for the uh, kind of uh, revenue generating activity that they would like to finance. Uh, what, are this, what are the risks and how are those risks going to be mitigated? And this is where the coordinating office comes in because this is the place where you can get the assurance that, appro that approvals will be issued, that uh, certain kinds of uh, norms in relation to currency exchange and uh, financing will be observed and that uh, risk mitigation can occur. Uh, that is essentially one of the key uh, uh, must-haves for private investment. And therefore, uh, guaranteeing that these other two sectors can work in harmony with each other. And so this is a hypothetical framework. In many cases, it needs uh, adjustment because of local circumstances. Uh, the, the government agencies may work in a different kind of configuration. There may be specific legal or cultural constraints that, uh, that dictate how, uh, or incentives that dictate how uh, business is done in a given community. And Jesus uh, asked me to talk about one specific example that uh, Chifa is now uh, essentially uh, developing as one of our pilot projects. And uh, he asked me specifically to talk about the most difficult one of all, which I thought was charming of him. Uh, and it happens to be the historic center of Beirut in the aftermath of the uh, disaster that occurred last August, which was for all intents and purposes, the equivalent of a huge scale natural disaster but caused uh, essentially by an accident. And we're all familiar, um, and, I, and I have to say that my own personal background is extensively in the context of uh, post-disaster events, having started my career at WMF in the aftermath of the Mexican earthquake, but uh, the organization really got its legs in the aftermath of the Venice flood of 1966. So. Uh, catastrophic response is, uh, is a standard uh, practice at World Monuments Fund, and I benefited enormously from the experience that I've gained over time uh, dealing with that. But this is a disaster of a mag almost unimaginable magnitude, and particularly for the historic, the few remaining historic neighborhoods of Beirut, uh, the city having been through a 15 year year disaster in the form of a civil war uh, in the late 20th century. And so uh, the impact of, of the catastrophe were almost beyond imagination. With <clears throat> Price Waterhouse uh, estimating just in, within weeks of the, of the blast that, there, that the damage to cultural heritage was in the range of 250 to 300 million with 400 listing buildings severely or moderately damaged and another 160 of lesser significance. Just recently, the World Bank uh, produced a report for a project that they're working on, estimating that the damage to housing um, is in the range of 1.2 billion with uh, almost all the historic buildings in uh, these neighborhoods damaged and a lot of cultural businesses out of business and 200,000 people made homeless. So their major program will be focused on the, that huge need. But as often happens in uh, these response packages, uh, cultural heritage sites because of the specificity of cultural historic environments and of historic buildings are not included in that large scale program. The large scale program will, uh, will provide new housing with new buildings for people who are homeless, but not necessarily deal with the cultural or the historic fabric. And I guess this is where uh, we and others come in. Uh, there is a, a small package within uh, this much bigger uh, objective of $15 million to restore a few historic buildings, particularly uh, residential buildings 
uh, as models for a much larger scale program that uh, the World Bank would hope to seed. And so these are the kinds of initiatives that can be built on. There are a wide range of respondents uh, on every level of engagement from the intergovernmental, the uh, UNESCO, uh, Habitat, the World Bank, everybody is there. There are a few governmental agencies that have uh, created a specific mandate for themselves, uh, in particular, the Directorate General of Antiquities, but without any specific funding. There's a wide range of NGOs that are, uh, have volunteered or even uh, been created in this aftermath, like the Beirut Heritage Initiative and the uh, Beirut Built Heritage Rescue. Uh, Chifa is specifically aligned with a group called Gaia Heritage, which is a uh, heritage management consultancy that's been in existence for about 20 years. There are banks interested, there are universities interested. Uh, at present, there's there is no um, coordination and uh, in particular, no uh, reliance at all on the government to provide that coordination. And on the contrary, uh, the general spirit is that the government uh, lacks the capability to, uh, to be the coordinator and uh, lacks any capacity to provide support. There is, however, a consensus about what the vision should be. And uh, that consensus dates back to long before the blast, a kind of prescient document that was published in 2016 by a young group of uh, activists, urban activists who were already concerned about the impact of gentrification and their concern for the loss of the character of these neighborhoods as a result of development. And so the, the there's a, there's, a, there's a wide consensus about the framework of what should be done. Uh, there is a lack of consensus or a lack of clarity as to how to do it. And if you look at this same chart again, uh, what's missing is uh, the role of the government, which is the huge uh, two out of three uh, columns of, of the uh, of, of this diagram and uh, above all the uh, lack of clarity about how this coordinating role that is so critical and was so instrumental in, in just about any successful urban revitalization program uh, it's missing in Beirut today and so that will be the challenge of the organizations that are numerous and uh, very very uh, motivated, but at present, uh, all working to in independent agendas. I just want to close this presentation uh, by encouraging you to have a look at uh, Chief's publications. The report uh, called Impact and Identity is available. Both of these are available on the Chief website, which is called heritagefinance.org but also on the uh, online publisher called issue.com, I-S-S-U-U. -S I came across a quote uh, going back to Beirut uh, from the Czech leader Vasquez Havel. Uh, World Monuments Fund had a very active engagement with the Czech Republic and Havel after the end of the, of the Soviet period. And uh, Havel said, I thought very appropriately, Hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. And I think that that is the, uh, the, the crucible we're looking for in trying to find a way forward with Beirut and with many of the other projects that uh, I've been involved with in the past and that Chifa is now looking uh, to bring forward as, success, as new success stories for heritage conservation. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to answering a few questions. Thank you, Bonnie. That was a great presentation, very informative. So we do have a first question from the audience and that would be, if you could explain to us what would be the main factors that would attract 
private investors into these urban um, regeneration programs and what kind of requirements would these would these need? Yeah, well, I, ref I did refer to that in my talk. Um, there needs to be an opportunity. Uh, an investor needs to see that there, there's change occurring, that there's change starting that, uh, that the marketplace can take advantage of. There needs to be some cushion, some assurance that uh, the project's not too risky. Heritage preservation projects have a reputation for being risky because of the factors that have to do with obtaining approvals, potential delays, and how long it takes uh, to reach profitability, whereas new construction projects are much more open and shut and straightforward. And, uh, and, and that opportunity can often be sparked by an incentive. Uh, to that that's created specifically by the uh, by the public sector, uh, knowing that their tax uh, uh, capture is going to increase over time as a result of this undertaking, and therefore giving early and early stages investors an opportunity uh, to come in with the insurance of getting of making a profit. And so, in the United States, for example affordable housing has so many uh, incentive factors from direct subsidies of uh, lower income residents to uh, building incentives and tax credits that it's possible to finance 100% of the cost of doing uh, rehabilitation of historic buildings without any risk of capital. And so the risks are only uh, going forward in terms of the stability creating a st stable enough social environment uh, that, the, that uh, the livability of the environment will <clears throat> be underscored. And so the, that's the formula you're looking for. <coughs> I'm not hearing that. I just but... realized I'm unmuted, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your answer. We have another great question from the audience. Um, some people from our audience would like to know whether or not TIFA has been involved in projects that go beyond just buildings. So more um, projects which <laughs> emphasize, you know, resilience and preparedness, um, you know, addressing climate change, and rather than just projects of regeneration. Um, specifically, our, our audience would like to know if there's some sort of uh, intervention for, you know, more of a cultural landscape and immaterial or intangible heritage? Has, has TIFA had any experience or how would they approach this? Um, absolutely. We're trying to get beyond individual buildings. Uh, and I think that's been uh, part of the frustration for people working in our field that uh, because of government, uh, the limitation on government resources, uh, government funding projects tend to focus exclusively around individual iconic buildings. And if, there, if that results in a wide scale uh, resilience uh, initiative, it's sometimes accidental. And I think that again is a, uh, one of the interesting and salient uh, elements of the Mexico City example, that all of those uh, factors, safety, uh, improvement of the environment, water conservation, uh, individual, uh, <laughs> building fabric conservation, infrastructure, um, sa public safety, bicycle routes, uh, all of that was planned, uh, envisioned from the beginning. And it was that, that occurred because there was a widely ranging, high level uh, intellectual discussion in, involving people in leadership roles across the community that helped to create the, that consensus from the beginning. And that's why I feel that stakeholder consensus building is in a certain way, the most important part of the project. Uh, all of our projects involve urban areas uh, and involve plans for uh, engagement of uh, creating employment opportunities, uh, creating improved environmental uh, conditions and including uh, public integration of public space and uh, public ownership of public space. And so uh, uh, 
it, it's it's that's the challenge is going to be to deliver that kind of integrated uh, response. Uh, but I think we have enough examples, uh, inspiring examples to learn from, and, and evidence that in the long term those examples are uh, financially viable. Then we have the confidence to approach things on this scale. Thank you very much, Bonnie. And another question, further detailing, and you know, something you did mention was about the stakeholders and you know the community itself. So our audience would like to know if Chifa has developed concrete tools in how to, um, you know, potentialize or 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 target specifically, you know, communities and the people um, who are subject to the areas in which you are uh, putting together these these you know urban heritage recuperation and, and regeneration projects. And what can, how can these be potentialized? How can they, you know, be further, further benefited per se? These, the community, the stakeholders, and you know, the people involved within the actual um, territory. Well, I think the way to address that is through the uh, choice of local partners, and uh, I, that's why I feel that the uh, local partnership is uh, the most critical part of this. And it, if we wanted to work. Uh, in environments where we don't find that there is a local partner in existence that can uh, provide that window to the community. Uh, creating it is, is, is essential, but I think that's probably the most challenging part of the proposition. And so, for example, one of our projects is with an organization called Turquoise Mountain Foundation that has been um, immensely successful in creating community cohesion in Afghanistan in the aftermath of um, widespread destruction in, in the city of Kabul uh, during the, um, the war and civil unrest that occurred there in the, in the uh, early 2000s, uh, where they've cre they created two or three vehicles, not only to uh, shelter people in the community who were made homeless through as a result of that, but to create new uh, employment opportunities to create um, whole new capacities in, in relation to treating the urban environment and creating, integrating uh, traditions, craft traditions, uh, and creating therefore a whole viable uh, ecosystem within their that uh, limited environment. And so their project with Chifa is going to be the uh, applying the same idea to a smallish community and a very important cultural resource that's abandoned in uh, the north of Jordan. So they have the experience of working with the communities. Um, what they don't have and why they're interested in uh, working with us is that they don't have experience uh, and don't necessarily want to acquire the experience of developing the uh, financial financing framework. Uh, they'd like for this site to become viable financially and support the lo local community. Uh, and so that's their, that's their goal. And we are in a sense the medium to try to put together the financial um, framework that will make that possible. Thank you, Bonnie. We're, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. And we were almost uh, up to time. So I just have a, a very brief question. It's actually very curious about all the work you're doing internationally. How, how are you doing this uh, right now in the middle of this um, situation in which you actually cannot travel? Your specialists cannot travel. <laughs> uh, I'm very puzzled by, by that in, uh, you know, in the work you're doing right now in Beirut. If you can just briefly illustrate that, uh, how are you managing those kind of situations right now? Well, uh, in a way, the, uh, the COVID emergency was a bit of a mixed blessing for us because it gave us the opportunity uh, to do the research that I think has helped, uh, has given us a toolkit that we can now use to put together, uh, like almost like a bunch of Legos, put together uh, how you're going to structure a specific project based on uh, the variables that exist in that local environment. Uh, 
And we're about to uh, mobilize two projects uh, in the field, which are uh, where we are not going to be able to be physically present. And we've all learned how to work with these virtual resources. And in some ways, we talk to more people around the world than ever before. Uh, so that uh, is also in a certain way a mixed blessing, but nothing is ever going to substitute for uh, being able to be there on the ground and understanding the physical environment uh, intimately from the ground up and having those personal relationships with the people on the ground. So we're assuming that this is a transitional moment where things are going to open up, where there's going to be a reset, particularly in relation to tourism, which was a great driver behind uh, heritage sites up until now, and which is uh, needing to find a new mission for itself. Uh, and, and that, it, it, in a sense, provides another opportunity. So I see it as a moment of opening. Yes, yes. Well, thank you, thank you very much. And I know there are there are many questions more uh, for what I see from uh, from Tatiana here, uh, but we're going to keep the questions and we're going to send it to you and we're going to uh, share the answers with the uh, with the audience. And uh, right you. now we're 57, 957 here. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Bonnie, for for your time, for sharing the your, your experience in the work that Chief is doing right now, all over the world. Um, thank you very much. And, and thank um, you for the opportunity. And, and we thank the audience and los invitamos a que nos acompañen el próximo, en julio, el primer martes de julio, donde vamos a tener a uh, un representante del gobierno mexicano que hablará sobre cómo está el gobierno mexicano actualmente articulando la revitalización y la puesta en valor de todo el patrimonio cultural y natural de forma simultánea en un proyecto emblemático, controvertido, pero muy interesante y que creo que va a dar mucho de qué hablar también. Los esperamos entonces y por ahora a todos pues y todas, muchísimas gracias y nos vemos en el próximo martes patrimonial de julio. Hasta luego y gracias.